Well, what really inspired me to start my journey into music was actually, I was living in West New York, New Jersey, 1964, uh, and the Beatles come on Ed Sullivan show. But then it turned to a journey of finding myself, discovering, you know, who I am through, through music and specifically the bass. You know, what's really interesting, I was actually playing guitar before. And this, I was self-taught, meaning that my parents, you know, they could not afford to give me lessons. We used to watch shows like the Jimmy Dean Show and Hoot Nanny and, you know, guitar-oriented. If they had a guitar, I was watching this show, you know. And so I taught myself how to play basically kind of like instrumentals like the, uh, the Ventures. Finally, my, my family, a few years later, we moved back down to Miami. And back then, we didn't have the social media that we have now. Our social media was basically the band in the block that we lived in. So I went down to the garage that they were uh, jamming because nobody had instruments. You know, like our drummer, the drummer in the band had a, 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 the Yellow Pages with drumsticks. He did have drumsticks, so that, that was cool. But he had a, a Yellow Pages and that was the snare and a box for, for, for the kick drum. He was actually kicking. <laughs> I, I bring my, my acoustic guitar and I go, yeah, I, I just moved into the neighborhood and I want to join your band. And they look at me and I look at them. And there's like four or five other guitar players. They go, well, if you want to join the band, you got to play bass. And I go, what's that? And one of them goes, oh, it's like playing a solo during the whole song. I said, that's me. <laughs> so actually me playing the bass was, was chosen for me. Yes, Cuban music, I mean, I was born in Cuba. My parents used to take us, me and my brother, to all these, you know, outdoor events. Music was usually played outdoors. It's an island, and see, the, the weather was really perfect. So to hear brass, like trumpets playing and echoing by the beach, you know, has a certain sound, you know? So it wasn't until my family moved to Jersey in 63, and then 64, we had the Beatles. And that changed everything. I mean, it changed everything even culturally and socially because when I first got to Jersey in West New York, uh, it was the first time that, that, I, that I experienced that urban, kind of like one block is Italian, another one is Irish. And then in school, it, it was basically the same. It wasn't until the Beatles came that overnight, we went from combing our hairs like, like uh, you know, like a pompadour. So the next day, we're just coming forward. That's when we started talking and socializing. This is when I started going to all my other ethnic families, you know, their, their homes, you know, kids in school, because now we have music in common. That broke down so many barriers for me Then I, that I got to like really learn about all the cultures and, you know, and all the families. And, and it was, it, it changed everything. My, my first big exposure to the possibility that I could be, that, that there's hope for me in the big time, was what, when I met Frankie Benelli, who was uh, you know, our drummer in, in the Metal Health version of Quiet Riot, of course. When I met him on my birthday, 1972, November 18th. Now, the night before, I had gone to one of the very few shows that that Bowie and the Spiders from Marzigi Stardust tour did in 1972. They happened to be playing in Dania. And there was a last minute replacement opening band. And I kept telling my, my friend, wow, this, this, this band is really good, but that drummer is just like, you know, beyond anything I've, I've seen before. The next day, I am hanging out of the local hangout place called The Flying Machine. And I'm talking to some friends, it was my birthday. And somebody says, Hey, that's one of the guys from the band that opened up for Bowie last night. And I make beeline just because I wanted to tell the guy how much I enjoy the band and how much I enjoy the drummer. I thought the drummer was fantastic. So I'm like, you know, ranting. And I, I stop and he smiles, goes, puts out his hand and says, Hi, my name is Frankie. I'm the drummer. <laughs> so we hit it off, you know, as people, friends, and then we started playing almost immediately. He's the one who taught me about a rhythm section. I didn't even know it existed before that. Before that, I was playing quinceañeras and, you know, bar, bar bands in, in Miami Beach and stuff like that. It wasn't until I started playing with Frankie that he taught me the, the fundamentals of being not only a rhythm section player, but a rock player. Because being Latin, I used to swing a lot when I played, which was okay with, with uh, R&B, 
soul music and things like that. But once I, once I started playing more British uh, rock, you know, more on the beat, I had to learn how to do that. Randy Rose, okay, I first started playing with him in 1978. And of course, you know, I had just passed the audition, I joined the band, and I have no background at all of who or what is Randy Rhodes. So one of the things that I learned is that in addition to us practicing a couple of hours, two or maybe two and a half, depending if we're working on new material, he had been teaching every single day for eight hours a day. So by the time he showed up to rehearsal, he, had been, he would wind up playing 10 hours. Having that level of musical integrity, that's the only way to actually, you know, reach the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame by himself. He's not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with the band. It's in as Randy Rhodes. In 1982, after Randy Rhodes passed away, I actually, I, I, I lost the joy of making music. Randy was my choir riot, my home connection to that collective consciousness <clears throat> that choir riot had. I get a phone call from Kevin. And he says, listen, Roots, uh, we're in the studio for a possible record, which turned out to be Metal Health. And uh, uh, we're recording uh, tr uh, Thunderbird. Would you like to come down? I saw, so I came down, and there's Frankie Benelli playing drums. Finally, 10 years later, we are in a studio recording. And of course, there's Kevin Dubrow, who I have been playing with him in the Randy Rose version of Quiet Riot, and Dubrow lived with him. So it's my family is back. What I had lost when, when Randy passed away, there was in the room. Here I am in this little studio, Pasha Records in, the, in, in Hollywood, and it brought back the joy of playing again. And then I finished the session, go a couple of days later, go out with Ozzy again to record Speak of the Devil. And by the joy that I had in that room with Frankie and, and, and Kevin just kept lingering. So when I was done with, with the recording, gave notice, I mean, it was one of the, the hardest, it was the hardest phone call I've ever, career-wise I've ever made, because they took great care of me, they were wonderful. But I needed to get the joy of playing music again in my life, and uh, I went from like one of the biggest bands in the world to the complete unknown, which was nobody knew what was gonna happen with Quiet Riot, but I was just happy making music again, which always comes down to that. You have to find the joy. If you lose it, you gotta find it somehow, some way. A few years ago, I started asking, I went on a journey to discover the healing qualities of music. Today's life events are collective consciousness. Our audience is coming to reconnect with who they were at that time, at the very moment when they heard the music for the first time. Now I am a little bit more focused on it. I know that this is what we're doing and it becomes more of a responsibility to be able to deliver that every single night. The Beatles, if you, want, if you see a photo of them playing at the cavern, they're like, within feet from each other. They're not on this massive stage, right? So they have their, their field, their frequency field is cross-fading with each other. Once, once they start, if you see a photo of them playing at Shea Stadium, little stage, they're still within the same distance. All of a sudden, it's not a massive stage and they're separated. I don't know if they understood that or they just felt it and realized it. It's all about frequencies that we give as emanate as human beings. And this is what we do. The only thing that we really touch to create music are the strings. We plug the string, we slap the strings, whatever you do, but it's the string. We don't play, play the bass. So the way I look at strings is these are the vocal cords. It sounds the same. This, this is where the tone is coming from. It's from the strings. We don't play the instrument. We don't play the pickups. These are here to actually reproduce, amplify the waves that we're creating when we play the string. But if you're not getting the right sound from your strings, you're never gonna find it with, the, uh, with a different amplifier. And as a matter of fact, I, I advise guitar players, bass players, string instrument players, if you're not happy with your bass, it doesn't mean that you have to buy another instrument. No, it probably is your strings. <laughs> 